Welcome from New York. This is Brett Johnson with One Med Radio. Today we are with Jason Napadana, who's the Senior Biotech Analyst at Zach's Investment Research. Zach's recently initiated coverage on International Stem Cell Corp, ISCO, traded on the OTC. Uh, Jason, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So tell us about International Stem Cell. What, what is the firm's business and what's the outlook? Yeah, so International Stem Cell is an interesting company from, from our point of view because, you know, we're big fans of the stem cell industry, uh, and ISCO, as, as they like to call themselves, has a unique technology that we think could be a meaningful driver for therapeutic product development and potential licensing deals in the future. Uh, we initiated coverage with a neutral rating and, and a dollar fifty price target, and we can get into the details of the rating uh, if you like, but I'll just kind of start with their technology and a little bit of background info. Um, if you look at the stem cell companies out there, you essentially have two competing technologies, one that utilizes embryonic stem cells and another that utilizes adult stem cells. So real quick, adult uh, embryonic stem cells are, are produced from a fertilized oocyte. Uh, fertilization occurs and the cells begin to divide. You get blastocyte cells that can be turned into embryonic stem cells, and these cells are highly uh, pluripotent. They exhibit strong proliferation, enormous potential for application and development of therapeutic products. The downside to embryonic stem cells is that you have the destruction of an embryo. You're terminating something that could potentially develop into into life, into a baby. Um, To get around the ethical dilemma, companies started working on adult stem cells. Adult stem cells are derived from human doesn't necessarily have to be an adult human, but, but uh, humans, we're talking far beyond uh, embryos here. Uh, and there are essentially two ways to get adult stem cells. You either do a, a liposuction procedure and get it through adipose or fat tissue, uh, which is a rich source of stem cells, far greater than bone marrow. Uh, but there's kind of questions that remain on how viable these cells are. Uh, if you look at bone marrow, well, a little bit more difficult to extract. You have to do a bone marrow aspiration procedure. Um, a little bit more complicated, uh, and you get a lower yield, but you potentially get uh, far more viable cells than in adipose. Upside to adult stem cells is there's no ethical issues, no destruction of life. Um, the, pul- the pulpiplurency is, is, is lower, and the proliferation is certainly far weaker than embryonic. So uh, along comes ISCO, and they have a technology called human parthenogenic stem cells. And what they do is they take an oocyte, that's an unfertilized egg, and they activate it with their technology, essentially tricking it into thinking that it's been fertilized by sperm. And the oocyte begins to grow and, and, and divide. And instead of a zygote, which is a fertilized egg, you get a parthenogenote, uh, which is an unfertilized egg. And it goes on to develop a blastocyte cells, uh, but there's zero potential that it's going to eventually turn into a, a life. Um, so you kind of get the best of both worlds with this ghost technology. You get the, the pluripotency and the proliferation of embryonic stem cells, uh, but with no ethical issues. And I encourage your listeners to, uh, to check out our research report because we got an excellent diagram in there on what exactly parthenogenesis is uh, and how these cells compare to embryonic and adult stem cells. Has there been any sort of pushback on you know the, the same groups that were upset with the embryonic stem cells in this? And is there any sort of regulatory issues that the firm has got to face in development of this new technology? Yeah, I haven't seen any. I mean, again, you're you're basically taking an, an unfertilized egg and tricking it into growing and dividing. Um, so eventually, that would 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 peter out and would die. I mean, there's there's zero potential that you can turn this into a, a living organism. Um, and, and so I haven't seen any uh, ethical dilemmas or any religious, uh, you know, objections. Um, as far as a regulatory standpoint, well, uh, any stem cell company is going to face regulatory hurdles when they file for approval, um, and that kind of remains to be seen, you know, what, what hurdles the FDA will place on, on ISCO, but I don't think it will be anything different from, you know, what's out there with adult stem cells. I got gotcha. you. Um, where does where does this fit in? I mean, how many stem cell companies are there now, you know, out and functioning in the in the U.S. marketplace? Yeah, there's uh, I, I would say there's at least a dozen or so, maybe maybe upwards of uh, 15, uh, 16 small uh, stem cells. I mean, there's a basket of these guys. Jaron is, is maybe one of the larger ones. Advanced Cell Technology, Astrum, Cytori, uh, International Stem. 
uh, Athersys. Uh, the interesting thing is that most of them are all small cap. Um, in fact, if, if you take, uh, let's say, the 12 largest small cap stem cell companies out there uh, and add them together, you only get a market cap of about $2 billion, uh, which is about the size of uh, some other kind of mid-cap biotech stocks like Cubis Pharma or Ameren Pharma. Um, so most of these guys are, are small and unproven, and uh, a basket of them uh, runs pretty cheap. So is that to say that sort of the stem cell space is really quite very early in its development? Yeah, absolutely. Um, very few, if any, stem cell products have been approved. Uh, the FDA actually just approved an autologous stem cell therapy um, for fine lines and wrinkles uh, a few weeks ago. Um, but most companies are kind of in early to mid-stage trials. You've got a couple of companies um, that are entering late-stage trials. But as of yet, no big blockbusters, a um, whole lot of promise, uh, but but uh, not a lot of actual sales yet. I, I liken it to where maybe the monoclonal antibody tech companies were, uh, I, I would say, even as far as maybe 25 years ago. Interesting. So a lot of the applications have been in the aesthetics marketplace. Is that is that right? And is that sort of also where International Stem Cell has got some products that they're selling in the skin space? Yeah, I mean, if you look at companies like Saitori, uh, they're certainly going after the cosmetic and reconstructive surgery market. It's a, it's kind of a low barrier to entry market. Um, Fibercell just got a, a product approved a couple weeks ago, and 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 Isco is generating revenues right now um, from a, from a dermatology product that's a, that's an OTC product. Um, the you know the rest of Isco's pipeline is, is therapeutic candidates, uh, but they're all very early stage. Mm -hmm. So is this like, did you say there's a subsidiary, the ISCO has a subsidiary that's in the skin, in the skin space, in the dermatology space? They do, they do. Uh, if we start with their therapeutic pipeline, um, which is where they're developing these human parthenogenic stem cells, um, their, their therapeutic pipeline is all preclinical. Um, the most advanced preclinical programs there are, uh, are for corneal transplant, retinal pigmentation, macular degeneration, um, they've got some additional additional things they're working on with with liver disease, metabolic disease, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, the corneal transplant thing is is the really interesting thing. It's the neat technology, uh, good opportunity outside the U.S. Um, and and uh, but but still preclinical and hoping to enter the clinic later this year. So that could be a catalyst for the shares. And when you look at their subsidiaries, they've got two subsidiaries. One of them is a cell culture life science media. Uh, division that sells these things to other either academic labs or other pharmaceutical or biotech companies. Uh, and then they've got a brand new dermatology division, uh, which is uh, just picking up momentum and, and we think really could be a driver um, for, you know, for the company later in the year. I saw in your research report some, some comparative photographs. I think it would that have been of the, uh, the, the, the one you just mentioned uh, that showed before and after skin treatment uh, around the eyes of, of, a, of a patient. It, it seemed a pretty remarkable um, improvement um, in the reduction yeah, of wrinkles. You know, it's really neat stuff uh, that, that they've did. And it's, it's an, it's, first and foremost, it's, it's an interesting story as to how ISCO entered the skincare uh, market. Um, as I said, they sell these life science media products for growing stem cells, and they sell them to other pharma and biotech companies. And the company's chairman, Ken Aldrich, was at an investor meeting not too long ago, and someone asked them, hey, if you've got, you know, you've got these media and it, it's so rich for growing stem cells, why not formulate it into something that you can use on your own skin? Uh, and so the, you know, the light bulb kind of went off for the company, and they took their media and cell extracts, and they formulated it into a skin cream. Uh, and they launched it in the first quarter, and they weren't really sure how it was going to do or what the, what the perception was going to be. Uh, and so they only made a lot of about 7,000 bottles, and, and this is not cheap stuff. This goes for about 150 bucks a bottle. Uh, and wouldn't you know, lo and behold, uh, all 7,000 sold. Um, you know, never underestimate the, the vanity in this country, right? So uh, all 7,000 bottles sold. It generated $1.1 in revenues, and it did so well that they sold out their entire stock, and they had to spend most of the second quarter rebuilding supply. Um, so we're, we're not expecting much in the second quarter in terms of sales, maybe some spillover sales, 
Uh, but management is telling us they'll be back on the market full swing in the Q3. And, and we think this is such an interesting opportunity, and it's such a large opportunity. The cosmeceutical market in this country is a, is a multi-billion dollar market um, that uh, we think they can get back up to a million in revenues in the third quarter and maybe as much as two million in revenues in the fourth quarter. And, and what's so exciting about that is it's all non-dilutive cash coming into the company. So instead of out there issuing shares and, and raising money through dilutive offerings, they're selling a product. Uh, and they're generating potentially as much as four to five million in revenues this year. I think they could do maybe uh, as much as eight to ten million in revenues next year uh, with this product that's designed for for fine lines and wrinkles and um, two different products, a night cream and a day cream. It's an enormous market opportunity, and we think it could be a real driver for the shares in in 2012, or maybe even later this year. Um, and, and what's exciting about ISCO is. They've got that driver later in the year, and then they're entering the clinic hopefully later this year. It's human clinical testing um, with their corneal transplant and their retinal pigmentation therapeutic pipeline. So, you know, we initiated with a neutral, maybe a little bit of a lull here as a second quarter over the summer. You know, not a lot of not a lot of big numbers expected for the Q2. Not a lot of updates on the pipeline. Uh, but later this year, I think you'll hear a lot more news flow out of these guys and. Um, that's kind of when we expect uh, investor interest to start coming to the story. So we, we initiated, we were a little early here with our call, so we came out with a neutral, but we wanted people to, um, to, to get to know the name and know about these catalysts that are coming in the, in the Q3 and Q4 and position their portfolios so that if they wanted to, to buy international STEM, they're, you know, they're ready in the, for, for 2012, which we think could be a good year for the company. What are the uh, what are the limitations of of the news the skin cream in terms of the well, two issues who else is in this space and what are they selling and how does it compare to what the, their product uh, the ISCO product has been producing and then also what are the limitations in terms of their capacity to to, to manufacture the product Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll take the the second part first. Uh, they're you know they made seven thousand bottles and sold them all in the Q1. Um, they're talking about getting up to a production level where they're going to make ten thousand bottles per month, uh, and they think they can get there. And if and if they get there and they're selling there, they think they can go with limited cost to twenty thousand bottles per month. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, this stuff sells for one hundred and fifty bucks a bottle. So so do the math, and you get a you get a, a pretty good opportunity. Um, as far what, as the what kind of production cost? What kind of production cost do you have a sense on the kind of the gross margins that exist for the product? Yeah, they're, they've they've launched it with a, kind of through a joint venture of a direct marketing uh, campaign, and so they're uh, they're keeping maybe about sixty percent of the revenues. The other forty percent is kind of going to pay for the marketing, uh, the, the the direct campaign that they're doing. Uh, I'm assuming kind of standard pharmaceutical type uh, operating margins around around the cogs uh and so maybe you're looking at uh 40% net operating margin on a, on a business like this. Hmm. And is it, is, there, is it market under a certain brand? Uh yeah. Or is there a uh, trade they have yeah, it's uh it's called Lifeline Skin Care. Uh, mm-hmm. And they have something called a, a night rejuvenating serum, uh, which you wear at night. Uh, and then they have a day serum, which also has an SPF. Um, so there's two products right now, uh, and I, they sell them either individually or together. And um, it, it's available online, and they're looking to uh, expand the distribution into, into dermatology and, and spas and things like that at a later date. Interesting. In terms of competitive, I mean, who else is selling something that, that provides a similar uh, outcome? Yeah, I mean, everything right now is is OTC, uh, and so it, it's all just. Uh, I mean, you've got some stuff that you see on the infomercials at late at night, stealth therapy and, and skincare kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, you're you're talking about competing in the cosmeceutical industry for fine lines and wrinkles, uh, and so you know, head out to your local. Uh, uh, retail store and, and check out all the names of the products on the aisle. You've got Oil Valet and, uh, and Nutriderm and, and you've, you know, an enormous number of, of products. I mean, it, it's what, an estimated multi-billion dollar industry. What's your sense about, from, from a scientific point of view, what's behind ISCO's product and what's behind these other products from, from the science point of view? Is it, is it comparable or are they doing something unique and distinctive in the, scientifically? 
No, I think they are. I, I think the the unique thing is that they're looking. They've got this uh, these cell extracts and this media that was used to grow stem cells and grow skin culture cells, um, and so they formulated that into something that you put on your skin to help rejuvenate and repair and grow your own cells. So it's not a chemical. It's not a mask. Uh, it's not something that uh, that you're going to put onto your skin and it's just going to plump it up and then you know it, it washes off a day later. Um, it's certainly not as far as a, as a surgical procedure, which is a product that Fibercell just got, not surgical, but an injectable procedure. Um, you know, you're not going in for a, a facelift or Botox or anything. It's not quite that far, uh, but it's uh, from a scientific standpoint, you know, we think it's beyond your typical... Uh, you know, face cream and lotion that's just loaded with, you know, uh, with, with chemicals and, and uh, glycols and things like that that just kind of either mask the fine lines or just kind of plump the skin up. Interesting. Well, it sounds like that, that, that could have a tremendous amount of potential and be a major driver for this, the, the company stock. Yeah, I mean, I think right now it's, it's only limited by supply and, and, and marketing and word of mouth. And, I mean, this goes a small company, uh, but I think they've, you know, they're onto something here that I think – uh, at the very least, could be uh, non-dilutive capital to fund the therapeutic pipeline. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's never going to be enough to take a, a billion-dollar, you know, a blockbuster, um, and, and it may, it still may never be enough to pay for a large phase three trial. Uh, but it covers their overhead, uh, and it could get them from preclinical preclinical programs into phase one, phase two programs, and then their business model is very much looking to partner and looking to license. Um, their human parthenogenic stem cell products. Uh, and so I think it creates a nice bridge from early stage development into that kind of mid and late stage development uh, through, you know, through non-dilutive capital. And it gives them commercial experience as well. I mean, they're on the market and they're selling a product. And, uh, you know, from an investment standpoint, it's certainly nice to see a company that's actually generating revenues and, and running a business as opposed to all just, um, you know, right. high-risk clinical development. And so 2010, they, it was, they did about a million and a half. Is that, is that right, in terms of top-line revenues? And, they're that looking, was all, looking yes, for... and that was all the cell culture division. That's mm-hmm. called Lifeline Cell Technology. Um, the skin care is a brand-new division with first sales generated in the first quarter of $1.1 million. So they've, they've almost done more than they've all done in 2010 just with first quarter of this skin. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way I model the skincare sales out, uh, just you know, kind of just based on the size of the market opportunity and and what I saw in sales in the first quarter, I think this could be a uh, you know a four maybe three four million dollar opportunity this year, and as much as an eight to ten million dollar opportunity in the next two years. Yeah, and it seems like it, if if this, you know if, if it catches on like it could, it could go much faster than. And grow much faster than that as well. I mean, that would be almost conservative, wouldn't it be? It, it certainly would be. Uh, as an analyst, I don't want to start throwing out numbers that uh, that get get crazy. And we've only been on the market for one quarter, and um, and and so I, I'm not going to start throwing out big numbers until I see you know real traction. Um, but it, it the cosmeceutical industry is a is a multi billion dollar industry. This type of facial cream and uh, topical cream market is multi-billion dollar market. Um, you know, you don't have to get a lot of market share to, to make a lot of money. Uh, and with a new product, and a neat product, a niche product, uh, and the right kind of targeted marketing and, and effective marketing, low-cost effective marketing, I think they could do pretty well. That sounds very exciting, Jason. Thanks so much. That's Jason Napoldano from Zach's Investment Research talking about International Stem Cell, symbol ISCO. Brett Johnson signing off for One Med Radio in New York.